Okay, I think, I think we'll make a start. Um, so welcome to the uh, first of the Bartlett School of Planning's public lecture series for the uh, academic year 2016-17. Uh, my name is John Tommy, I'm Professor of Urban and Regional Planning here, uh, and I'm going to chair this evening's event. Um, every year we run a public lecture series, um, and these lectures are intended to bring leading international thinkers on planning and the built environment before an audience of colleagues, uh, students and, and guests. Um, so there will be more of these lectures over the course of the year. Look at the website uh, for details of the programme. Uh, next month, for instance, we'll welcome Nicole Duran from uh, Sydney University. In January, Alex Schwartz from the New School in New York. And the series culminates next May with the Sir Peter Hall Annual Lecture, which this year will be given by Professor John Forrester at Cornell University. Um, so, let me introduce uh, tonight's speaker and say a little bit about why we wanted her to come to London to speak to us. Rachel Weber is Professor in the Department of Urban Planning and Policy at the University of Illinois at Chicago uh, and a Faculty Fellow at UIC's Great Cities Institute. Her research and teaching uh, lie at the intersection of urban economic development, public finance and, and real estate. In particular, her work focuses on the uh, impact of capital markets on urban economies and the built environment. Now, Rachel's recent book, um, From Boom to Bubble, How Finance Built the New Chicago, attracted our attention. Uh, and caused us to invite her to UCL to speak this evening. The book forensically explores how speculation in capital markets, in conjunction, interestingly, with the routine professional practices of those involved in the development sector, led to commercial overbuilding in Chicago's loop during the millennium boom uh, between 1998 and 2008. What's interesting about the book is that it shows how the local state was called upon to absorb the surplus left on the wake of this finance-led boom, helping to subsidise reposition office buildings and sub-markets, blighted by tenant losses and over leverage. More than this, I think, the book is valuable uh, for its reflection on the role of theories and methods in advancing our understanding of cycles of commercial property development. It charts a route, if you like, between the orthodoxies of urban economics and real estate economics on the one hand, but also the limitations of some radical critiques on the other. Um, and I think it develops an original analysis of the financialization of urban development, which is based on rich empirics, uh, not highly polished theory, emphasizes the complex role of human agency in all of this, and the facilitative role of local government in shaping outcome, uh, urban outcomes in, um, uh, in Chicago. I strongly recommend the book. Um, apart from all of its other qualities, it's also very elegantly written. So who's Rachel? Rachel uh, has a Bachelor of Arts in uh, Development Studies from Brown University, a Master's and PhD in City and Regional Planning from Cornell. Um, she was appointed to then presidential candidate Barack Obama's Urban Policy Committee in 2008 and by Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel to the Tax Increment Financing Reform Task Force in 2011, but that was fun, um, to provide recommendations to his new admin administration for reforming this uh, financing tool. So as well as being uh, academically rigorous, her work is strongly connected to live urban policy debates. Uh, she's currently a visiting researcher at the University of Barcelona from where she's come to join us this evening. So Rachel will speak for about 45 to 50 minutes, um, and then there'll be opportunities for question and discussion. And I would like you all to join us afterwards in the reception in the foyer outside this lecture hall where there'll be uh, wine and uh, probably something to eat as well. And for those like me who missed lunch, that will be very welcome. Um, so Rachel, uh, welcome to London uh, and to UCL. Uh, and for the next 45 to 50 minutes, the floor is yours. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you so much, John. That was one of the nicest introductions I've ever received. It's nice to have somebody who's actually read a, your book introduce you instead of just reading the, the blurb on the back, which often, uh, often happens. So thanks to John and everybody else here at Bartlett for inviting me to come and address you today. Um, and John, as John has mentioned, I just finished a book. Um, 
and it's about the sort of rhythms and tempos of urban redevelopment, development in Chicago, but I think it has a lot of applications for what's happening here in London, what's happening in, in other cities across the globe. Um, so we'll get started. And uh, I guess I, I wrote this book, one of the reasons why I wrote this book is I wanted to sort of revisit some of the, the orthodoxy, the sort of urban economics textbooks that I had read when I was um, in school, in, in graduate school. Um, and uh, I like this quote here, the top here, it's Saul Bellow, you know, what a kind of a native son of, of Chicago. And I think that, you know, even though historians and prophets have been flummoxed by these cycles of, of urban development, it's really economists, people like Richard here, you know, who've, who've spent most of their time, who've spent sort of the most time trying to measure the length and frequency and amplitude and speed and causes of these real estate cycles. Um, and then the bottom image is from Homer Hoyt's 1933 classic. I'm sure you, you all have it at your bedside, A um, Hundred Years of Land Values in Chicago, which is this really important historical text that I feel I was kind of in dialogue with the whole time I was writing this book. Um, so like Hoyt, and I, like I said, the sort of urban economics textbooks that I read when I was a student, I was kind of, I was interested in what I saw as a, an important elision um, in, 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 this, in these texts. I was taught that the supply of buildings is always a function of the demand for space by occupants, by tenants, who are seeking to maximize their utility, of course, within given budget constraints. My textbooks called it derived de demand, derived that is from household formation, job growth, and business growth. So this means that construction cycles should closely track the business cycle, that the skyline should mimic the general sort of ups and downs of the underlying economy. You get the picture. Now, mind you, I was in graduate school in the early 1990s, I'm dating myself, um, when cities like Chicago or New York, which is where I'm from, or especially cities in the South, like Houston and Atlanta, these were cities that were dealing with a surfeit of what they called see-through buildings, right? New buildings that had no occupants um, that were built during the 1980s boom. Um, and they were still dealing with the rapid depreciation of the existing stock that was caused by this overbuilding. But even when precocious urban planning students, I'm not naming any names, would raise their hand and point out that demand and supply sort of seemed to spend a lot of time being misaligned or sort of out of kilter, some of my professors held on to the sort of party line of general equilibrium models. Uh, they said that developers were actually building for future demand and that the price mechanism would eventually recalibrate supply and demand conditions. If there was some kind of asynchronous behavior, if supply got ahead of demand, for example, that it was often blamed on the distorting effects of government intervention. The things that we do as planners like permit buildings um, or zone for certain land uses or in some cases or in many cases people pointed to national legislation like in the 1981 um, Economic Recovery Tax Act or IRTA uh, which in the United States created hard to resist incentives for developers like things like accelerated depreciation deductions. When financial markets, institutions, or instruments were mentioned at all in my textbooks, they were treated as followers, not leaders, in the realm of property development. Finance existed to validate the impulse to build, which was really just driven by this interplay of developers and occupants. These omissions were also obvious in the autobiographies and biographies of developers that I read, autobiographies of people like James Rouse, who developed uh, the Harbor Place in Baltimore, or uh, he who shall not be named, uh, Donald Trump, our current uh, pre presidential candidate who wrote, or it, it turned out he really didn't write, a book called The Art of the Deal, um, where he portrays bankers and investors as um, only important when the developer, the city builder, was seeking backing for some grandiose plan. Um, in fact, he sort of portrays most bankers uh, small-minded and risk-averse in comparison to himself, you know, who's this again, sort of visionary city builder. And he uses some very colorful language, some of which I won't repeat here, um, to describe bankers, you know, who dare to doubt his plans or for the 
he calls them burons, which is a combination of bureaucrat and moron, um, who dared to regulate him. Um, but this book that I wrote breaks with this kind of dominant strain in both the kind of autobiographical work and in, in land economics that focuses almost exclusively on demand for space and ignores finance. However, I didn't abandon this orthodoxy casually or ideologically. Instead, I revisited these older debates about building cycles and tried to apply their insights into the, you know, into, to the, like the, the empirics of the kind of causes and effects of what was going on in Chicago when I moved there in 1998. I was particularly interested in why the sort of up cycles, why these sort of construction booms that are like a steroid shot for cities and urbanized regions seem to so often continue past what seemed to, you know, what their sort of natural sort of expiration date um, was, resulting in significant vacancies and in the aggregate contributing to the kind of financial volatility that has the capacity to do things like bring down the global economy. Um, in contrast to the work of land econo and the land econ economists that I was reading, I, I took a more sort of mixed methods approach, analyzing not just property statistics and vacancy rates and sale prices like Homer Hoyt did, but also uh, contemporary and historical texts about the evolution of the real estate industry, as well as interviewing about 80 in, uh, developers, brokers, you call them agents, uh, facilities managers, appraisers, and investment advisors to understand how they conceived of and talked about sort of temporality, time, in, in the built environment. And I should say, as a caveat, my focus was really on commercial as opposed to residential. So I was looking at sort of income generating buildings uh, that included mostly sort of offices, retail, and to some extent multifamily apartments. So lucky for me, the city of Chicago, as I said, I moved there in 1998, was just starting up another major construction boom in the loop, in the downtown. Um, and I call this book, as John said, the millennial boom. Um, and I date it from about 1998 to 2008, 2009. Although you could argue that it was actually three separate boomlets. And I think this is interesting, kind of trying to periodize construction booms. I think, again, while I was looking at Chicago and I talked to people from other cities, it seems like there are some sort of parallels here. So I think like in the first part of the boom, this first sort of boomlet or wavelet, which I date from around 1998 to 2001, we see the beginnings of the boom because we see a couple of uh, big commissions, build to suits, right? So you do have occupant demand um, that is getting developers to produce new supply. So here's a picture of the Blue Cross Blue Shield building, which is interesting because it's a very sort of flexible building. It was built in two stages. The first stage was in 1997, and then they had built another 25 stories on top in 2010. And actually, they, and while the bottom was functioning as a, you know occupied office building. Um, but this was a, a commission. You also have at the sort of first phase of the boom, mostly local developers who are willing to be risk takers, mainly because of their local knowledge. They really understand the market. So we had a couple of local developers who put up some speculative, speculative space, right, space that did not have any committed tenant. Um, and this was the first time, I think in 1998, we see the first speculative building. Um, there, there were low vacancy rates in that time, around 9%. Other local developers took note and sort of initiated this sort of first wave of office construction, which peaked in 2000, but then unfortunately there was a recession in 2001, which eliminated about 45,000 jobs in the downtown. But very local, the developers who sort of were initiating it were very local. The sort of second wave of building took place after the recession. I would date it from about 2003 to 2006, with deliveries peaking in 2005. And this sort of second wave produced buildings that were on average larger, more architecturally ambitious, and sited in more sort of high profile and expensive locations than the first wave. This was also a, a, a wave that was sort of initiated by local developers, but local developers in the second wave were joined by national and global developers, um, developers like Heinz, who's based out of Dallas. And they constructed a new breed of premium office building that brokers la labeled Class A+, because of the size, location, um, modern interiors, and sort of gross, gross asking rents that were over $50 per square foot. And then a third boomlet, uh, 2007 to 2009, 
Granted, the office market's timing was not great, but it produced, in my mind, some of the most beautiful buildings, some of the most um, sort of innovative and creative buildings. Um, this is uh, Heinz's um, 300 North LaSalle. Um, and these were buildings that were delivered just before the credit crisis was blowing up. We also see risks taken in the area of land uses. 2007 to 2009 is when the most apartment stock came online in the downtown, which had historically not been a place where there was much residential development. So all in all, the boom added about 15%, depending on what your sort of geography is, 15% new office stock in, in terms of the square footage over the 130 million square feet of office space that existed when the boom began. Although it was smaller than the 1980s boom, the new stock made Chicago feel much more modern architecturally because by the end of that boom, over 50% of the office stock had been built after 1980. It was also distinctive for the change in land uses, sort of flipping the Park and Burgess concentric ring model on its head, we, where we do see residential uses in the downtown core. And this is a map, it's hard to see, but the kind of mustard colored circles are residential. The size of the circle is relative to the, the amount of square footage in that location, and the pink is the commercial building. So my question, it's a relatively easy question, what was driving this boom? It wasn't employment growth because employment wasn't growing. The Chicago never, Chicago never really recovered from the 2001 recession. In fact, office using employment was declining as these green glass and steel towers were going up. In fact, by the end of this 10 year boom, and even before the worst of the recession hit, there were 8% fewer office using jobs than when the boom started. So we had 15% growth in office space, 8% decline in the number of office using um, jobs. The failure of many dot coms and layoffs at big law firms and advertising agencies left millions of square feet of subleasable space downtown. Combined with the secular trend of dis declining space per employee because of things like telecommuting or contracting out, um, vacancy rates swung to about 20%, not including the shadow space that was being sublet sort of under the table or was just, you know, just being sort of kept on the books. Now in the book, I provide a kind of uh, overbuilding index because I wanted to know, well, where did, how does this stand relative to other cities in the United States? Um, and Chicago is actually, I would say, it's sort of an average um, example of overbuilding. So some cities and urbanized regions, particularly those in the South, West and Southeast, so cities like Phoenix and Tucson and Atlanta actually overbuilt to a much larger extent. And I use the sort of overbuild, I try to um, operationalize the concept of overbuilding and I sort of measure it in terms of the um, difference between the vacancy rates when the boom started and when it end, as well as the percent new um, office space. And as I say, Atlant cities like Atlanta and Phoenix are, are much higher than Chicago, which is, is more similar to the national average. So in some ways it's a, it's a case study of a kind of average instance as opposed to a sort of an extreme outlier. So overbuilding doesn't mean that these new buildings were empty. They weren't the see-through buildings of the 1980s. Au contraire, their vacancy rates were quite low. Um, but, and then I, I did this analysis using establishment level data done in Bradstreet data and also analyzing vacancy rates by submarket. I found that the tenants of these new towers were overwhelmingly businesses that were already located in the loop. So there was a kind of uh, musical chairs sort of nature to this sort of uh, construction. In many cases, like the proverbial chicken, tenants had literally just moved across the street. They had crossed the road from one office building to another, staying within the same um, sort of, we have zip codes that are six digits long and then a four digit sort of um, after a hyphen, even within that sort of four digit zip code, they sort of stayed within that. Moreover, most of the businesses that moved were not growing at all, but instead, instead were decreasing in size, so they were taking up less space having moved. So in the literature and in my interviews, um, many people dismiss this idea that you had to have employment growth or employment change in order for there to be a corresponding or a concomitant change in the built environment. Um, it doesn't mean that you need to have, you know, more, more jobs you just need, or, or more demand, you just need to have different demand. For example, tenants at this time may have wanted 
higher performing buildings, buildings that were more sort of technologically innovated to increase their productivity. Um, they may have altered their demand to favor buildings that had, for example, more exterior space, um, wider core to window depths, more open workspaces for those, for, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, kind of collective uh, meeting room types of space instead of individual offices, or larger blocks of contiguous space uninterrupted by things like columns or elevators. I call this the sort of obsolescence argument, this sort of that there could be a technological or design motive to relocate. Um, and this was a little more difficult to pin down empirically. I did interviews, I interviewed, like I said, facilities managers and tenants uh, about their decisions to move, to move again sort of across the street. Um, and my impressions were that many of them were very ambivalent about moving. Uh, few had initiated the search for new space themselves. They were more often sort of convinced to move or the idea to move came from a broker um, or an agent. And even more of a challenge to this obsolescence argument or hypothesis is the fact that few of the tenants who moved to these new buildings seem to have enjoyed reduced rents overall um, or reduced operating costs or have raised revenues, you know, to some evidence of productivity increase as a result of their moves to these more modern buildings. It seemed to me that these buildings were going up for some other reason. Now, uh, you already know what the title of my book is, so this is not going to come, away, come, come as much of a surprise, my, my punchline. Uh, but I argue that it was, it was capital markets, um, specifically the cheap cash that was made available through the sale of new financial instruments by both investment banks and by city government that played a larger role in sort of catalyzing this millennial boom. Um, and particularly sort of starting in around 2002, as the slide makes clear, sort of unhinging the occupant market from the development one. So a little bit of background, um, and this is you know, sort of my development finance class. I talk a little bit about uh, income generating buildings as assets. And it's often hard for planners to kind of wrap their head around this concept because they say buildings more for their use value, for the value they provide, their utility, the fact that they provide shelter or a place for people to sell their goods or services. But in the, in sort of from the perspective of investment markets or the capital markets, buildings are just another kind of asset. And they're looked at like you would look at a stock or a bond, right, as an in income generating asset. Um, but the problem is that commercial property is not a natural born asset, it's not a natural born investment vehicle. In fact, property markets are regarded as some of the most illiquid ones available to investors and in that real estate is an opaque kind of asset. It's not standardized, um, it can't be sort of sold continuously at a price that everyone in the market knows. The quality and the value therefore of a high rise office building in San Jose, California is not public knowledge or, you know, nor is it easily sort of fathomed, particularly if the investor is located in Memphis, despite the fact that we have these wonderful new data sources. I subscribe to uh, data sources like CoStar and Reese. I mean, there's been tremendous amounts of improvements in terms of real estate data. Um, and the appraisal industry has become more technologically sophisticated. There are no, new methods, you know, new software that can be used. But still, when, when it comes to real estate, there's always, you know, you talk to brokers and there's some sort of secret, right? There's always something about a building that may not be transparent to somebody. Um, think of your experience maybe trying to rent a flat somewhere that you don't live, right? There's a, you always expect some, you know, some, some, some bad news um, or you never, you never exactly know what to expect. And particularly in real estate, which is still kind of a kind of guild uh, like industry, a lot of really important information is very sort of heavily guarded. Moreover, a building's value fluctuates depending upon what neighboring property owners do, whether local governments are planning to invest in infrastructure or amenities nearby, uh, and just the changing demographics in an area. So I talk about sort of the history of real estate finance as this sort of challenge uh, of trying to convert property, this kind of idiosyncratic asset, into a financial commodity. Um, and I talk about sort of the process of sort of acidization or financialization. These are sort of attempts to kind of lower the barriers uh, to liquidity that the real estate industry, real estate finance has been trying to solve for this last century. Sort of how do you overcome 
the sort of idiosyncrasies of place to turn an asset as slow and local into a commodity that is fast and global. So financial institutions have figured out different ways to do this, you know, for the past, uh, you know, hundreds of years. Uh, in a classic case of what, of what Greta Krippner calls capitalizing on crisis, a uh, classic, you know, where kind of crisis begets a solution that begets another kind of crisis. What happened in the sort of 1980s, 1990s with the, is that the U.S. government created something called the RTC, the Resolution Trust Corporation, to help get banks, insolvent banks, out of the real estate crisis of the late 1980s, 1990s. And so what it did, did was it created these instruments that are, it, it turned the commercial real estate holdings of banks um, into derivatives that were sold off as these new instruments. They were called commercial mortgage-backed securities, and, or CMBS. And market acceptance of these securities was a little slow going in the early 90s. They weren't really sort of selling like hotcakes, but then held, uh, helped along by things like the Russian financial crisis, um, in 1998, you had record low interest rates, so you had investors who were trying to get sort of more, more juice out of their investments. And then also, I think very importantly, the sort of the tearing down of the walls that were erected during the 1930s, during the New Deal era that separated banking from investment. We see the kind of that these CMBS uh, asset the instruments really took off. Um, and at the forefront were global investment banks like Wachovia, you can see from the slide, Credit Suisse, J.P. Morgan, uh, we see Lehman Brothers, and then I've highlighted in red a bank that I spend a fair amount of time talking about in the book, LaSalle Bank. So LaSalle Bank was the only regional bank. Um, all these other banks are big money center global banks. LaSalle Bank was a regional bank headquartered in Chicago that developed one of the largest CMBS platforms in, in the United States. Uh, now, thanks to the movies like The Big Short, have you guys seen that movie? It's really I recommend it. Um, you're probably familiar with how these kinds of derivatives work. Uh, what CMBS, what they do is that they basically combine the debt on different commercial buildings, different buildings, and repackage that debt into bonds that are rated, the tranches of the different bonds are rated and sold off to different kinds of investors, so mostly in institutional investors, banks, uh, private equity funds, um, it's much easier to purchase a share in one of these instruments than it is to, you know, purchase a building itself, particularly because these shares, you know, the, the, these pooled income streams have been abstracted to a rating, right? They're rated by the credit rating agencies who are apparently sort of asleep at the wheel. Um, but they were, you know, if you, you want to buy a triple A tranche, that's, you know, malls or office buildings, it's much easier if you're you know, a pension fund to buy that than to go looking around yourself and saying, I want to buy that mall and that mall over there. Um, so what CMBSs do, in a sense, is sort of they partially strip buildings of these idiosyncrasies, of their distinctive quirks, and they kind of release them from their social context to some extent. It makes them more liquid. So the effect of these instruments was pretty immediate. When this, when this sort of area, this, this field went, um, really sort of took off, what, what happened was they drew new investors into the field of real estate, the sort of mass speculation. They made investment in commercial real estate much more accessible uh, for all of this kind of global money that was you know, sort of swirling around um, in, in the mid-2000s. Uh, and you know, whereas so was less than 2% of all commercial mortgages were securitized in the 1990s, over one third of all commercial real estate loans originated during the first decade of the 2000s were structured as CMBS. And you can kind of see that taking off. It's really the maroon or kind of reddish second um, sort of layer that represents the, here this, uh, slide shows ABS, is ABS stands for asset-backed securities. So this is a a, 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 an image that shows all commercial mortgage flows, you know, and you can see the sort of the growth, particularly sort of starting in 2003 and kind of crashing down in 2008. So what does all this, what do CMBSs have to do with development and planning, right, the things we care about, uh, particularly development in Chicago? 
So, you know, as when you think of these kinds of complex derivatives and securities, your first thought is probably not Chicago. It's probably the city of London. It's Wall Street and New York City. Um, and, you know, we can certainly see how the skyline of, of London and New York might reflect the health of the sector that's involved in selling these kinds of derivatives. But while these nodal points attract a lot of attention, they're merely the last link in a chain that standardizes and moves capital from smaller, more diverse settings to investors in these metropoles. And when you host the third largest commercial real estate market in the United States, as you do in Chicago, and you're known as a city, you have a reputation as a city for being a place where deals get done, where development takes place, where the local government is very open to the construction of new assets, well, you end up supplying a lot of the raw material, right? The, the, the mortgages that were the inputs for these CMBS, for these instruments. It's kind of a parallel to the boom towns that become boom towns because of the, um, the uh, discovery of some natural resource, like natural gas in, you know, in North Dakota, right, where you have these boom towns. So approximately 160 of these CMBS loans valued at close to $10 billion, were made to purchase or construct commercial office buildings in the city between 1998 and 2009. Um, some were for new construction, but most went to purchase existing real estate. So about 85% of all the office buildings in downtown Chicago were sold at least once during this boom. So a lot of transactions going on. Almost overnight, Chicago became a city where investors could purchase multi-property portfolios whereas most previous sales had been one-offs, like individuals being sold. Most of Chicago's iconic office buildings, hotels, were, were purchased or refinanced with these CMBS loans, in pri with prices often that were so inflated that they bore sort of scant relation to the condition of the underlying asset or the, the, in or the income that the asset was capable of generating. So in my book, I lay out what I call the financial life cycle of a building, from construction to securitization. And I talk about how these different stages in the life cycle reinforce each other. So I argue that securitization, what it is, what it, was, it would broaden the base of possible capital sources, it expanded the volume of funds available to refinance existing buildings, and importantly, to erect new ones. Developers that I interviewed indicated that they were closing, closely watching the CMBS market. They were looking at bond yields. Um, for signals about when it was time to build, which I think, again, sort of turns the real estate, uh, you know, the sort of urban economics textbooks that I was reading, as I said, as a grad student, kind of on, its, on their heads. My questions about vacancy rates were typically brushed off. Lenders, too, seemed uh, much less concerned about the softening employment base than whether or not they could sell the mortgages that they were making. And to keep up with demand for these mortgages, they made more and more loans. So I argue that in Chicago, at least, the sort of debt-fueled securities and acquisitions markets, as opposed to the lackluster occupant market, was really what allowed developers to get construction funding and for all these new buildings to be coming up. And what happens is that because the CMBS market tends to sort of cherry pick the bigger projects and the better projects in terms of income generating, you had all these smaller regional banks that just sort of rushed into construction financing in some ways to kind of compete with the big boys. Um, one developer said he would have jumped out of an airplane without a parachute before 2008. So confident was he about accessing finance. Another developer I interviewed actually started a project before he had acquired a construction loan. You can call this, as the Fed does, a temporary easing and credit standards or in the urban political economy, language of urban political economy, you can call this financialization or acidization. And I do use this financialization sort of literature, and I, I feel like contribute to it, I sort of deepen it. Um, I challenge the idea that financialization, however, unlike some of my colleagues in urban political economy, is something new, right? Many people date it to the 1970s, kind of when neoliberalism, uh, you know, kind of became sort of the sort of political economic regime, or sort of mode of economic governance in cities. I argue that CMBSs are just one in the latest, you know, kind of a, in a long, one of the latest in a long line of these kinds of financial innovations or spatial temporal fixes that have been invented to overcome this liquidity problem. When these instruments are adopted, real estate cycles 
uh, appear to skip a kind of down cycle, or as Keynes noted, the length of the up cycle hyperextends, amplifying markets' ups and downs and preventing them from adjusting to the oversupply of new assets. In the Chicago market, you can kind of date this period where it really just sort of, the, the, such a kind of detachment between the occupant market and development market to around 2005, six and seven, um, the sort of inflection point when there were some really major sales, uh, big, um, uh, in, in particular, there was a equity, equity office um, properties, which is a big um, office building REIT, which was sold to a private equity firm and the largest private equity deal in history. I mean, a second way in which I complicate the financialization story is that rather than focus exclusively on the structural forces leading the economy in this direction, I highlight the agents who are responsible to, for knitting together financial and property markets. In a lot of the geography literature, urban geography, urban political economy literature, finance is treated as a kind of ethereal force that imposes its will on the built environment from above. With some exceptions, much of this scholarship obscures human behavior, seeing the built environment as the result of external and autonomous forces with no obvious or necessary involvement of knowledgeable agents. In contrast, I argue that an extensive set of ongoing locally situated relationships have to exist in order for these spatially intensive yields to flow from property to investors. Capital's attraction to and movement through the in built environment doesn't, doesn't just happen on its own. Arguments for it need to be facilitated, or arguments for its free passage need to be articulated by actors who possess ac expert knowledge and stature in the field. Buildings can only become vehicles for capital accumulation. They can only become assets because of the practices and social, socio-technical -techn mediations of myriad on-the-ground economic agents and organizations. And in Chicago, I was already connected to a group of people, you know, professionals in this field, a sort of network. Um, when I turned my attention to writing this book, I just started interviewing them um, a little bit more systematically. Um, and I really came away with the sense that these local actors were critical, that their sort of routine practices helped to draw the sort of global capital to specific assets. Um, that the brokers and appraisers and market analysts and planners that I was interviewing, they created the conditions for financial flows to gain a foothold in the city. And Chicago has historically hosted a, a, a very sort of a sizable fraternity uh, and it is kind of a fraternity, it's very sort of male dominated of, of real estate and finance professionals. Uh, about 350,000 individuals worked in the commercial real estate sector um, at the height of the boom, which is higher than sort of share in, in the national economy overall. It's the re regional headquarters for a lot of real estate intermediaries and related financial services. Yet at the same time, it's kind of a tight knit club. Um, very relationship driven as opposed to other cities that are described as being more transactional. You kind of go there, you do your deal, you get out. In Chicago, uh, you know, peer groups, political affiliations, social connectivity, all slow filtered through race, religion, and ethnicity influence where, whether your deal gets done and on what terms. These agents do a lot of really important things. So one of the things they do is they provide data, information, lease expirations, market values that inform the decisions of developers and financial actors. But I argue that they do more than that. I argue that they play a really important role in, in positioning buildings in relationship to e each other. Um, you know, so helping tenants, for example, compare or separate out the good from the bad. Um, Mar Michel Callon, uh, the French sociologist, talks about the kind of market devices that professionals, sort of economic agents use, these kind of institutionalized practices that help markets achieve coordinated and synchronous, synchronous action. Many of these market devices were really important um, in the sort of movement of tenants and the sort of attraction of global capital. And in the book, I spent a lot of time talking about obsolescence. I've already mentioned it. Um, but I th think that that was really important in help in in that uh, the kinds of agents I was interviewing, they helped to kind of co-produce or co-construct obsolescence in older buildings. And in doing so, they were kind of tapping into these age-old treatises on valuation that, that held that commercial buildings had a kind of innate life cycle, uh, most 20 to 30 years for a commercial building. So real estate professionals argued that they needed to add more stock 
because the buildings from the previous boom of the 1980s were just 20 years later, I'm using quotation marks, dogs or past their prime or in need of a good facelift. One developer poked fun at uh, a, a skyscraper for giving off a strong smell of the 1980s. He said, it was that dark ruby red or cranberry carpet or, and dark walnut on walnut with more walnut. This is an example of a, a lobby of a building in Chicago that has this sort of you know, marble. This is an example of kind of classic 1980s office building lobby. So I'm not saying that obsolescence is not real or that these older buildings really you know, weren't, that they, that they weren't harder to maintain or to utilize efficiently. But I do think that these mar market devices like obsolescence sort of go beyond the material. Um, they're social constructs. They go to the sort of effective level as professionals seek to elicit emotional, sort of visceral responses from their clients and partners. Even decisions that could be made according to a cost-benefit type of calculus sought effective resonance and aesthetic engagement. One commercial broker justified his relocation of a law firm from a slightly older building to a newer building on the basis not of bottom line types of efficiencies, but rather in terms of a more transcendent and intangible kind of well-being. After denigrating this older building as obsolete, he said, and I quote, when they came to their new space with light and air that had a much lighter design, it was like they all needed sunglasses. They just had a pep to their step. By frequently rehearsing narratives of obsolescence and stories about the irreparable damage that time has wrought, these professionals instilled in others a generalized sense of dissatisfaction with their older dwellings and helped to make obsolescence more material. In the book, I talk about other, these kind of market devices uh, used, like the highest and best use that appraisers use, class A, B, and C, which is the topology that brokers use, um, blight, which is a concept that local governments use to kind of denigrate certain older buildings. These are all different kinds of sort of social conventions um, that are used to encourage the consumption of new buildings. For example, other, other examples include, include how brokers advised major tenants to steer clear of those buildings that had already, been uh, had already been claimed by their competitors. So for example, once one major law firm moved into a new building, other law firms on the same rung of the status hierarchy refused to move there too. That building was symbolically marked as the property of the first mover. And for reasons of pride and repute, tenants also refused to occupy the space that was vacated by their competitors. It was kind of an admission of their lower sort of <coughs> rung, their lower sort of rank in the status hierarchy. These are all social conventions that help to kind of, <coughs> excuse me, produce this desire to relocate. Therefore, creating a desire to construct new buildings. Um, these market devices helped to make buildings into objects that were legible and calculable for capital and that were pegged in performance to each other so that actors came to some agreements about when it was time to build, which was partly a decision about when it was time to discard. These social conventions combined, combined with material incentives, I'm not saying it was all kind of in the realm of the effective, but there were material incentives for tenants to relocate to new buildings. For example, new landlords, new property owners often offered concessions you know, no rent for a few months or lower rent for a few months in order to encourage existing tenants to move. Um, and also the financial instruments that I talked about, all these things help to overcome some of the obstacles that real estate presents as an investment vehicle, like its social embeddedness, its opacity, its sort of sluggish production timeline. In other words, these social conventions help to make real estate liquid. Whatever their strategy, this, it seemed to have worked. There was a record number of new office leases signed during this 10-year period. Uh, 10 of the 20 largest law firms in Chicago relo relocated to new buildings. Um, the effect it had was that older buildings, particularly those built in the 1970s and 80s during the, just the pr prior boom, were labeled obsolete and had a really hard time holding on to their tenants. Um, this is an iconic sort of modernist uh, postmodern office building, uh, this, the Smurfit Stone building, the IBM building. Um, these suffered from higher vacancy rates as their tenants new, moved to, new, to decamped to, the, to new buildings. 
In the words of one of my interview subjects, they approached or were nearing the end of their 30-year life cycle. They were fully depreciated, but not yet appreciated. So where is the local state in this? I'm sort of moving toward my conclusion. I mean, I've talked about developers and financiers and this kind of set of intermediaries that help to kind of knit together property and capital markets. I argue, I put a new sort of spin on sort of the growth coalition, um, growth machine literature, by arguing that the local state, in this case the city of Chicago, functions as both. They function as both a in real estate intermediary um, that uses these kinds of social conventions like blight to denigrate certain buildings and to kind of market certain newer buildings and newer submarkets. But they also, very importantly, act as a kind of financier, um, providing capital um, and sort of governing through finance. Um, in Chicago, local governments laid the groundwork for the millennial boom before it, year, years before it happened. They did things like um, uh, upzone certain targeted areas to allow for more intensive uses. They created more flexibility and informality in the existing zoning code. Um, they, uh, you know, to allow for new kinds of uses that hadn't been there previously, like residential. They bought land and sold it to developers at below market prices. And they used this uh, particular an, a financial instrument, in some ways a kind of parallel to CMBS that I just discussed, called tax increment financing, um, which is a form of land value capture that's very popular in U.S. cities. In Chicago, uh, close to one third of the city is covered in these TIF districts. And um, my impression is that it's beginning to be used here in the UK. I think in Manchester, for example, there's an example, or there's a, there's a, there's a use of TIF. And TIF is not just a subsidy, it's not just an incentive um, that cities use to promote growth in specific locations. It's another way to sort of knit together the property and capital markets. And basically what it allows local governments to do is to convert its tax base, it's the sort of future property taxes that will be generated in these districts, into new financial instruments that are transacted in public debt markets. Whether it was intentional or just lucky, six of the eight TIF districts in the Central Business District were in place before the greatest run-up in property values ever to occur in Chicago. These funds were then available. It, became, it was kind of a discretionary set of funds for the city of Chicago. It kind of People who don't like TIF call it a slush fund for the mayor, but it's a little bit more than that. But it, this amounted to about $600 million every year, right? So it's not an insignificant amount of money, but it enabled Richard M. Daly, our mayor during this boom, to become an important partner in the redevelopment of the loop. The TIF funds were used in three ways that were, are important to my argument. One is that it helped to create new assets that could then be transacted in these global financial markets. Um, Basically, the developers who are building these new office buildings received TIF subsidies, either to purchase the land or to, to demolish the building that was on that site, and so paid for one of their, you know, some very important development costs. Secondly, they were used to actually help to kind of co-construct or to create that market for those new buildings. So one of the eligible expenses, the eligible costs that TIF can be used for is to pay the relocation expenses for a building to move across the street. So it could pay for those relocation expenses, the moving expenses. TIF could pay for the build-out uh, that the tenant um, wanted to see in the new building so the, the space could accommodate their, their needs. Um, so we see in this kind of uh, musical chairs that there was actually a lot of city money, um, many people, including myself, would argue, being inefficiently used as basically, you know, the tenants, mainly corporate headquarters, moved from one sub-market to another. And then lastly, TIF was used to kill off some of the excess capacity that might compete with the new office buildings, or the, at least the office buildings that were made redundant by the new construction. And it did this by subsidizing the demolition of uh, some important buildings in the loop. I'm not, the, the amount of demolitions that took place during this boom um, pales in comparison to the amount of demolition activity that took place in the 1980s boom. But there still were some major demolitions. This is a picture of the, the Merck, Chicago Mercantile Exchange that was demolished in 2003 with TIF funding. And then also importantly, without actually demolishing the building, you're kind of killing off the former use and converting a building into something else. You're effectively sort of taking it off 
the market, making it not compete with the new buildings by turning, let's say, an old historic you know, vintage office building um, that didn't have a Class C office building into uh, dormitories or to condominiums or to rental buildings or to hotels, which happened a lot in the downtown. Some have characterized municipal governments as late to the party, but in my book I argue that they actually actively extended the curfew, creating the political preconditions for financialization. So it was a fun ride, but when the dust settled, was Chicago better off, worse off, because of this millennial boom? So we ended up with some gorgeous new buildings, even I will admit them, buildings that I love, an abundance of Class A space downtown, which I think as planners we would argue is a good thing, um, particularly if you think of a kind of regional economic structure. I'd much more rather see there be a kind of concentration of economic activity downtown than it be sort of spread, sprawling throughout a region, right, in terms of environmental effects. But we ended up with a lot of half-empty modernist and postmodern buildings constructed only 20 or 30 years earlier, which in the words of one of the brokers I interviewed, sucked wind after their anchor tenants moved to the new buildings and could not be backfilled by new businesses. A handful of new owners of these Class A, older Class A buildings and Class B buildings modernized and upgraded them, but many of them um, you know, whose you know, buildings were affected by this stampede of tenants to the, to new, to the, to the new, belt, new buildings ended up in a kind of purgatory. These buildings weren't old or architecturally significant enough to convert to hotels and apartments, but nor could they lower their rents sufficiently to hold on to tenants and still turn a profit. They became obsolete, kind of a self-fulfilling you know, prophecy. When the boom ended in 2009, there were almost 50 contiguous blocks of um, 100,000 square feet blocks of, uh, of empty office space in the loop. And to make batters worse, most of these same buildings, the sort of overstock of the boom, were the ones that were purchased with these CMBS instruments uh, during the bubble. This meant that they were appraised at inflated values, inflated, inflated values and building incomes weren't sufficient to pay off their debt. In fact, the securitized loans, the, the buildings that had securitized loans were the first to experience financial distress and foreclosure, which of course then led to sort of decline in the building's condition. So the sort of, there was this relationship between operating costs and the sort of financialization. Some deals were so complex to restructure that the owners simply sent the building's keys back to their lenders, a phenomenon acerbically called jingle mail. It just sort of walked away from these buildings that were in financial distress. Beyond the issue of which property owners were winners and losers in the loop, I address the larger problems associated with debt-driven overbuilding in my conclusion, like the global financial crisis, which was, by most accounts, the most severe in history. Right, we'd had other, other experiences of this, uh, depressions and crises, after mass speculation, the introduction of new financial instruments, like the Great Depression. Um, but never before, not even in the 1930s, did so many banks and so many countries find themselves at the exact same moment requiring state intervention to keep from failing. Looking to the future, we see that developers have become accustomed to building in overbuilt markets, more indifferent to the presence of surplus space and more responsive to the vagaries of global capital markets. I think this poses a, a, a challenge, many problems for planners, um, because as we see the sort of even more tight connections between property and um, capital markets, they become even less regular and predictable. And you know, in some ways, it's part of the, the narrative of planning to be able to forecast the future, right, or to sort of understand what the future is going to bring, to be concerned about sort of the needs of people or what kind of infrastructure we're going to need. It's going to be, it's going to be harder and harder to do this. This kind of volatility, I think, really presents a challenge to planners and anybody in the field of sort of forecasting and cycle spotting, um, you know, even if it's just part of our narrative, not necessarily even part of our actual work. And that's actually the topic of my next book, um, how this kind of anticipatory gaze, sort of future thinking, gets operationalized in both planning and finance. And with any luck, you'll invite me back in another eight years when that book is complete. So I'll end here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.
thank you very much, Crystal, for uh, a very engaging, um, carefully argued, and clear presentation of the uh, themes of the book. Uh, there's an opportunity now to, to ask uh, questions. Um, I don't know about half a dozen, but I'll try and resist asking them. So, right, yes, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, you, you very briefly pointed and talked about tenant inducements. Um, did you look at some of the tax implications about how tenant inducements and their capital costs can be written off over the term of the lease rather than over a longer capital period? And um, I mean, I think, so that's kind of a double benefit, right? Yeah. Um, no, I, I didn't look at that specifically. I mean, I wasn't actually sure about what the tax treatment of that would be and whether or not that would be something that would be tax deductible. I think, though, come to think of it, they probably are. So the benefits of those concessions, which are, again, something that's very hard to gather information on. It's one of those kind of closely held secrets. Nobody will tell you just how much they're giving away. And I think if that kind of information was publicly accessible, the kind of data that you know, people like me and others are trying to use to understand what's really going on in this market would look really different. So asking rents, for example, you know, would look really different. You're get gathering data and you're, oh, you're seeing like rents look like they're going up. Well, this, this is good. This is what's supposed to be happening, right? Um, but if you actually saw what the rents, the sort of effective rents were, what, what the tenants were actually paying after these concessions were counted in, you would see that they would be much lower. I don't think you'd see the, this the sort of market data registering um, that kind of demand that people sort of thought was really out there. And it was one of those kinds of like, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, like we all know what's going on, but nobody could actually sort of put their finger on sort of how big of a phenomenon it was or how much it actually, by how much it actually would sort of reduce um, yeah, the well, rent data that was available. They were selling the mortgage-backed securities based on these. Yeah. yeah okay. The published rents, right, but not the actual rents. So observation, really, rather than a question. Excellent lecture. I thought your analysis of how capital markets drive the cycle is spot on, and that would be true in London and any other city as well. But listening to you, I was also struck by what you might, the importance of what you might call the psychology of status, because mm -hmm. I think this is very, very important in real estate, and it affects all the actors. Mm -hmm. So if you're a developer, you have to believe that you are putting up the best building mm -hmm. and however many others are going up, it's immaterial. Mm -hmm. Yours is the best. And so you get this whole dialogue about trophy buildings mm -hmm. and therefore you need a trophy architect mm -hmm. and so you need a Rogers building or a Foster building or whatever. And the same thing affects investors. You'll see investors, big investing institutions, their brochures, their glossy brochures, they'll be full of city office buildings. They don't want an industrial unit in Bradford, doesn't look very interesting, although the industrial unit in Bradford almost certainly is giving them a better investment. Return. And I think it may explain also why your occupiers were moving across the street, although they couldn't actually articulate why they were doing it. They may have been told that the building would be more productive or efficient, although I don't think there's very much evidence that that is the case, actually. But they were also told that it would enhance their status to be not in a 20-year-old building that everyone is denigrating, but in the latest generation. Mm -hmm. They move up the pecking order. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the whole psychology of real estate. I mean, it's true in residential as well, but particularly mm -hmm. in commercial. Yeah, it's very, very true. And I think there are a lot of parallels with the advertising world in terms of sort of selling, selling sort of luxury commodities, the same kinds of, you know, advertisements you see that sell, you know, Rolex watches, you know, that, that same kind of, the same sort of fuzzy lighting and beautiful people selling show up in the same, in, the, in those advertisements. And yeah, when I would ask people, I mean, they would talk about the kind of bottom line stuff, but then they would say, well, one of the main reasons we're doing this, you know, and we're moving, we're a law firm, is that our you know, X, Y, and Z competitor is doing it, and if we want to attract the best talent, we also have to be, there was a kind of arms race mentality too. It's like, we would, we would like to not have to do this, but if our competitors are doing it and they're able to kind of um, establish their status and prestige with the, you know, the um, occupancy of one of these trophy buildings, that we, we are sort of forced to do the same. Yep. Oh, yeah. um, um, I'm curious about your, your TIFF map. Mm -hmm. um, why is that odd shapes? Ah, well, <laughs> um, 
<laughs> yes. Well, if you saw the, an overlapping map of the political jurisdictions, the wards, it may make a little bit more sense. So they are just like electoral districts in the United States, gerrymandered. I don't know if that's an expression that you use here as much, right? So the, there's a political gerrymandering for the TIF districts. And one of the main reasons, it's not just ward or jurisdiction. So, you know, we have 50 elected city council members, and they all want to make sure that they have one in there. But one of the main reasons why they're the, this sort of odd configuration is that you want to try to maximize the value. And in a TIF district, value is not based on starting value. The TIF is all based on the moment of designation. So and let's see, in this one, 2006, um, the future appreciation. I should, didn't mention that these TIF districts last for 23 years. So what you're trying to do if you're the city government or you're a developer who stands to be the recipient of funds in one of these districts is you want to gerrymander the district to maximize appreciation. So not, in, not, in, in not initial value, but appreciation. So what are you going to do? You draw the TIF district, the boundaries around things like vacant parcels of land, public housing, Right, things that are undervalued or zero value. If it's public land, if you convert something, a parcel that was zero value because it's state owned, and you convert that into a 50 story office tower, you can go from zero to 60 in a, in a matter of years, two or three years. You can, all, and all that money then becomes money over which the local government has authority and importantly, autonomy. So this is an off-budget funding mechanism that doesn't require all 50 members of city council to approve things. Um, and so basically, you know, the city planning department who ultimately has um, kind of final say, the mayor has final say, but has a lot of control over how these monies um, are allocated, you're thinking of you, you want to maximize that value. So if it means drawing the boundary out to include that vacant parcel right over here that's sure to be a 50-story office building in five years, that's what you'll do. So it's very interesting to actually go to, to walk the boundaries and you'll, it, you, you, you begin to sort of understand why they were designated in these weird ways. Okay. Oh, yes. Well, first, I haven't read the book, and that's a fault of remedy very soon. But <laughs> before I do that, now you. You know, I just made 32 cents. Thank you. You were talking about obsolescence. Mm -hmm. I think it's a bit of well, the discussion you're having with Richard mm -hmm. there, about uh, obsolescence, obsolescence as a, a social construct, mm -hmm. and all this discourse about obsolescence. Mm -hmm. Now, I found it very interesting because in the last. 10 years or so, there's been a lot of literature on obsolescence mm -hmm. in real estate, a lot of technical literature yeah. trying to show uh, how it could be measured and what it means. And you are sort of twisting it around and, and saying, well, a lot of this is a social construct in its usage, that what you demonstrated. But you said also that you, you tried to try and measure how much of it was social construct mm -hmm. and how much of it was real. So uh, if you could explain a little bit on um, yeah, no, I, I can't tell you 50% of it is, you know, social and status, and then 50% of it is actually material obsolescence. But I do, rather than say, oh, it's all just sort of made up, it's all this discursive, it's all performative, I do think that there is something to it. I do think that, um, uh, you know, some of these buildings from the 1980s were harder to operate efficiently. Um, that many of them did have, they were kind of overwrought. They were, you saw the images, they had a lot of marble. Um, they had big, you know, partner offices where the trend now is to move towards smaller offices and have more communal meeting space. So there were really, there were changes in design, engineering, building materials, technology. A lot of the buildings in the 1980s were built um, pre revolution and in information communications technology. So before, you know, the, they, and there wasn't enough space on the, you know, um, below the, the floors to fit all the wiring and stuff. So there were, there were, I feel like, legitimate reasons why you would want a building built in 2004 as opposed to your building built in 1985. Um, so I don't attempt to say, like, oh, this is material and this is, but I'd rather just, you know, or this is, this is discursive, but I, I try to show how those things are related, right? If you have a kind of discourse about obsolescence, 
a building will become obsolete because the tenant will be dissatisfied and it'll relocate and then you'll have less operating revenue to pour back into that building to modernize and retrofit and keep up with the technological changes. So I think rather than say, you know, you can draw this kind of thick line between these two, I just, I try to argue that they m are mutually reinforcing. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. Thoroughly enjoyed that. I think one of the questions I have, you talked about the careers of your institutional entrepreneurs, the mm -hmm. people that were local that stitched all the bits together. Mm -hmm. And you drew a contrast between markets that were more transactional, mm -hmm. so other cities where those happened. So do you think it led to a different character, or how was the character mm -hmm. different in Chicago because they were locally embedded and mm -hmm. lived with consequences? Um, you know, that's a good question. I think it's not like in the transactional cities we didn't see commercial mortgage-backed securities. But I do think we had to have a lot of people who were kind of on the ground in order to make these things work. And, and that's one of the reasons why I argue that you had a regional bank who, that got into the CMBS platform. Is that like, you know, this LaSalle Bank was kind of like the developer for, or they were the bank for every, every developer in, in, in the city of Chicago. And in some ways, their entering into CMBS world kind of made it more legitimate for everybody, for other banks to move in that direction. They were kind of a first mover and everybody sort of followed. Um, so I'm not saying that that couldn't happen in other places, even with a more sort of transactional, you know, kind of less familiar, less sort of small, kind of tightly knit kind of a club. But I do think that those relationships were really important in sort of bringing just the volume of CMBS at, to Chicago and the fact that they had a kind of regional lender who all of a sudden was sort of playing with the big boys, right? It was operating at that national scale. Tomaso, yeah. Uh, thanks for uh, the lecture. Uh, my, my question is also related to this point of the effect of securitization and the mechanics of securitization. Because what I know about the residential market mm -hmm. is that it is, you know, a very long uh, credit chain. The, mm -hmm. the, um, you know, the, the extent of the tranching is huge, so mm -hmm. it's not so clear for uh, uh, the, the issuer of the mortgage who, you know, will end up owning uh, mm -hmm. which tranche. Whereas you seem to suggest that at least in the Chicago market of the of the CMBS this chain was uh, more known to the actors mm -hmm. and, and yeah, basically, you know, those network effects mm -hmm. played, uh, played a role. So, mm -hmm. can you elaborate a bit? Yeah, no, I think that with the CMBS, one of the differences between just sort of uh, like the subprime market and these other mortgage-backed securities that were based on residential is just the number, right? They had thousands of individual homeowners' mortgages that were then yeah. sliced and diced and put into these bonds. With the commercial mortgage-backed securities, the actual numbers of property which was much more limited, um, but they were larger and more complicated, right? They weren't just like single, like, I mean, the number of just bungalows on the southeast side of Chicago who had mortgages and that went, I mean, there was a kind of standardization of the residential market that kind of went, and whereas these were sort of, uh, they were kind of more complicated properties, but they were, there was a smaller number of them. And I do think that um, just given the fact that there was a smaller number meant that, you know, a f financial distress in any one of those um, properties could really affect the value of the whole instrument. And so this sort of extra local knowledge and kind of reassurance and a real kind of like all the sort of backing up of the quality of these office buildings that these local actors provide, I, I'm, I'm arguing was was more important in that in that regard. Claire. Um, thanks, Rachel. I just wanted to pick up on Claudio's question mm -hmm. about obsolescence. I'm obviously not um, as knowledgeable on the real estate side, but I got really interested in the sort of economic sociology of aging that you did when you talk about the devices. Mm -hmm. And it really reminded me Voices of Decline by Bob Borgard mm -hmm. and Miriam Greenberg work on Branding New York, where they, from an urban policy point of view, really carefully deconstruct the construction of decline and, and mm -hmm. obsolescence from a sociological point of view. So my question to you was, what was the role of the media in this, both the general media, the, the social media, or the specialized press? Because mm -hmm. I guess they also played a big role in fueling mm -hmm. some of these processes. Yeah, definitely. Great question. There's. Um, I think that the media, um, you know, as Logan and Malich argued many years ago, 
are an important actor and an important partner in the sort of growth machine um, and this kind of growth coalition, that they play a very important point, very important role in positioning um, buildings and in, in positioning sub-markets, in identifying markets that are hot, right, and, and running stories about all the new restaurants and all the new activity coming to this place, and then also running stories that talk about the trials and tribulations of the owners of and the you know and the, the financing of these older buildings in distress and they sometimes they make these kinds of simplistic distinctions between submarkets good bad and and the buildings themselves and in some ways i mean the the you know the real estate press in chicago and i you know don't i hope none of my friends who are journalists are in the audience but in some ways they play a kind they 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 almost act more as like they, they publish press releases almost of the new buildings without a whole lot of analysis or criticism or what's really going on in big picture. And then as soon as the market started unraveling, there were all these stories about how everything was horrible and how come we didn't know. And it's like, well, you guys were part, you know, part, you were involved in this kind of, um, you know, happy talk and propping up of the market too and talking out, like making a really big deal whenever a tenant would move to a new building, like, you know, look at this kind of, you know, in the sort of, a very sort of optimistic spirit about how the economy must be doing well because there is this movement, but they were, um, you know, uh, want to kind of question it while it was happening. Um, and then I think when it started to collapse, there was a lot of sort of pointing fingers and why didn't we notice this, but they... You could operationalize all that in many English cities. Hmm? You could operationalize that, yeah. you know, picture in a lot of English cities where the media is precisely that kind mm -hmm. of war. Mm -hmm. Is there uh, any last questions from the audience before I might abuse my privilege as chair? Ah. Question. The question I wanted to ask was, what does the local political class think mm -hmm. that it's getting from this? You know, you mm -hmm. talk about you know, the whole tip story in Chicago is perceived internationally as an innovator mm -hmm. in this kind of uh, area. And it's attracted a lot of attention from um, certainly from the UK and so on. Um, but yet, you know, you're demonstrating that a large amount of public money is going into um, activities which are providing very little benefit, public benefit mm -hmm. for, for the residents and for the citizens of the whole of Chicago. Mm -hmm. So what does Mayor Daly or, or Ram Emanuel have? What, 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 do they, you know, what do they see that they're getting out of this in terms of uh, their constituency? Well, I think getting back to Richard's point, I mean, I think it's not just the private sector who benefits from these kinds of the performance of status and prestige. I think, you know, cities obviously compete with each other for capital and for development and for investor interest. And uh, this new, having a new building and having the press report on it, so in this kind of fawning over themselves, this kind of glowing fashion, is a feather in the cap for a mayor, right? To be able to be present at the ribbon cutting for the new building. Surely the citizens of Chicago can see through this. I don't know. They like them too. They like those new buildings where we love our architecture. When I interviewed one of these, one of the developers, he said, "In Chicago, we just like new buildings. You know, it just makes us happy. It makes us feel good about ourselves. You know, it's like the Cubs, who is our, you know, our, you know, our kind of sad little baseball team. They're going to the World Series. It's like the same thing. That same feeling of pride, I think, is you know, when when a new building, particularly if there's a famous architect associated with it. Um, if your data is showing, sorry, mm -hmm. discussion. But if your data is showing that there's no employment growth associated mm -hmm. with this, mm -hmm. how do they sell that? You know, I mean, mm -hmm. presumably, you know, future you know, future demand, and to some extent, I mean, it's hard to. Um, down, you know, I think in some ways there is an argument that having more glamorous class A downtown office space is a good thing if we care about, you know, uh, sprawl and the kind of, you know, regional economic structure. That, that's one tenant that didn't go to a suburban office park and force everybody to drive to that new location. It's downtown where the, the most of the infrastructure, the transit is all concentrated. So that's a, it's a good thing. It's capitalizing on prior public investments in the downtown. I think another thing is just that, and this is a big difference with the UK, and we were talking about this earlier, we are, we're a property tax. Our, our fiscal structure is dominated by the property tax. 
And so even if a building is empty, it's still the owner is still paying property tax, and commercial property taxes are higher than residential ones. So in some ways, I, I think the city doesn't necessarily care if an office building is empty, you know, as long as the owner is not behind on their property tax. Now, one thing I didn't mention that I've done other research on is the number of uh, property, uh, commercial property owners who appeal their property taxes. So they're assessed at a certain rate, and then they hire the best lawyers, many of whom themselves have spent time in public office. The number of city council members and our current in, uh, legislators in the General Assembly in the state legislature who are in some ways affiliated with the property tax appeal process is really quite astounding. I mean, it's a huge industry in Chicago. So they pay their high property taxes, again, on paper, <laughs> but you don't see the concessions. You don't see the sort of amount that they've been sort of um, negotiated down to. But that's one of the main arguments, is that this is, there's, this is, there's a fiscal imperative yeah. for cities to do this. And then there's revenues to then do things like build infrastructure or Millennium Park, which is over on that side, which all this new property tax revenue that was coming into the loop helped to pay for. And that's an amenity that many of us love. Um, that's a wonderful addition to the downtown. So there's some trade-offs, right? All right, I'm going to uh, draw proceedings to a close there. If you have any additional questions, um, I suggest you put them to Rachel over a glass of wine. Let me, let me drink some more water first. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so we're going to conclude uh, this session. There are drinks uh, just outside. I think there are two sets of drinks, so make sure you drink the right wine, otherwise you're going to be in trouble. Uh, is on this occasion. Um, yeah. can, I, can I conclude by uh, thanking uh, Rachel? Uh, I think I, I can tell that this is going to be really enjoyed that presentation. Mm -hmm. I think you've made a few sales. Of, oh, uh, right. You probably made $3. <laughs> 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 so can, I, can we show our appreciation of the traditional manager?